What we're going to try to do is uh, give an example of something uh, that we can build and, and have fun with and, and hopefully some of you can play along with and, and, and get it working on your own computers. Um, I've also brought the actual hardware along with a couple of examples um, and we can demo those and also have a chance to talk about this field and, and where it's going and, and whatnot. Okay, so I think sometimes, particularly I don't know about where everybody else lives, but where we live in Sydney, if you're not actually in the business of making things, um, we don't often see just how much automation is around us. So this picture on the left is actually in our library. So this building here on the front, that's our library. And this picture on the left is actually what a large, port, large chunk of the library is dedicated to. That's where the books are kept. And that's about a three-story high robot that pulls these books, which are in boxes off the shelves, and, and brings them to, uh, to users of the library when they need a book. Um, and so really, I've been at the uni for seven or eight years, and this is the, I just saw that robot quite recently, actually, with one of our classes. And that was exciting and a good reminder of how much sort of automation lies behind the scenes. Um, on the right, those are automated forklifts that have actually been built in Sydney by Dematic and they're being shipped there. This was just two weeks ago, they got shipped, their first automated forklifts being shipped to a beverage company in Sydney. Um, and I think you can't look at a picture of an automated forklift without being a little bit scared about what's gonna happen in the future and whether this automation is gonna take all our jobs. <laughs> and um, that question gets asked a lot and it's a good question to ask. And I think the answer is sort of clear, but we can, um, one of the examples I like to, to give is, is to think about what life was like a couple hundred years ago. And if you think about just prior to about 1850, just about everybody lived in darkness because candles were too expensive. Um, and it would take more than an hour of work to buy an hour of light. Um, but as technologies progress, that the amount of time required, the amount of work required to buy an hour of light has really dropped massively, particularly as we moved along in technology from beef tallow candles to whale oil to gas to petroleum and electricity. And now an hour of work will buy at least 20,000 hours of light of good quality, you know, enough light to light a room. And so that's a, a massive change in, in what we have to spend our time doing. Similarly, if you look at transportation and food, um, most car production is quite automated. And until, you know, even still, most Australian citizens can buy a car. It might have been built in Australia. Um, and that's certainly a big change from any time in the past where, you know, efficient and rapid means of transportation to own that was well beyond the means of most people. Similarly, you can look at data on food costs. And if you look at the past 100 years, the number of hours of work required to buy a chicken, for example, has gone down from, you know, at least three to now a quarter of an hour. Um, and if we look at information, and that's where we start to get closer to what we're talking about today, books were, of course, also once a, a luxury, expensive item, and, and now they're quite cheap, and beyond that, di digital information like Wikipedia is still orders of magnitude cheaper. So that's enabled open source communities like what's around Arduino to make complex technology incredibly user-friendly, because there's just, you know, millions of people using it, and a small percentage of those people put information up for free that helps us all figure out how to do this. And so um, the sort of take home from that for me is that, yeah, automation certainly is going to put, um, change the way that what we do with our time. And some of that's for the better. And certainly there's no candle workers anymore, even though there used to be a big, big, a big community of candle workers. Um, and more change is certainly going to come. But the time that's afforded to us by all this stuff is the reason that we have time to play clarinets and use cricket bats. So. Um, there are concerns, but uh, generally I think it's all good. So, a little bit closer to what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to use an Arduino, right? Looks like that. Um, there's a picture of one there. And what we've got to do to make this sort of a useful tool and to understand the full picture of automation um, is we've got to put some sensors on it. We've got to have some interface circuits. That's the next step. And that goes to a processor, which really does some computing. Then there are some more interface circuits and then some actuators or some outputs or displays or something like that. And all of that together is sort of what we call mechatronics. And it's what enables our automation. And, and I think, well, we'll get to more about why I think that's interesting later. 
So this Arduino, which is pictured in the middle, is much like any computer. It has a processor. But what makes it sort of handy is that it has a bunch of built-in interface circuits. And so those interface circuits, you can sort of see on that picture. Let's see if I can get my mouse here. So along the top row, do I have a, is there any way I can ask how many people have used an Arduino? If I got one or two guys on the video. Have you used one? Okay, anybody online? Of the, people are typing. We've got some answers coming in. Uh, yep, someone says, I have. Okay. Okay, one says yes. Cool. Um, a bit. My okay. dad uses it a lot, so I didn't want to know what it's about. Awesome. <laughs> Limited use. Okay, well, there's some, so that's good. That's, that's fine. Um, and so some of this will be review for, for many of you, and for others, that's okay. So on that Arduino, we've got some numbered numbers running along the top. Those are numbers for di general purpose input-output pins, or digital inputs and outputs. They can sense whether a voltage is high or low, or they can be written and told to be a high or low. Along the bottom, in the bottom right corner, we have some analog inputs. And some of these pins have special extra capabilities, and all that's enabled by some circuits that are built onto this blue PCB. So to use it, um, we basically need a little bit of electronics, so some wires usually, you know, I've got, this is sort of the type of stuff that we end up with, a bunch of wires like this, and some resistors, and usually we buy, we encourage our kids, our students to buy kits, because um, it's a good place to start. And then you still need another computer to program it. So you need to have some understanding of programming. And we're actually going to spend a bit of time today doing the programming, and I'm hoping you guys can, can work with me on that. All right, so let's think about an example project um, that we can attempt here. Um, so it's going to be a reaction timer. Being the Olympics on, I'm, I'm a big fan, I'm loving the Olympics. Um, that's an important part of lots of, of uh, sports. And um, so they vary from person to person, but they can be improved with training. And so we'll build a little, a little electronic gadget here that, that uh, can measure reaction times. And it can be a little game because you can play it and you can try and do better and it's tend to be fun. So that what I've got pictured there is actually the, the, does anybody know what these are? Anybody? These little, the lights, the set of lights there? There are a special set of lights from a particular thing. What are they? Traffic lights. Well, they're not quite traffic lights. They're actually the race type, the, 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 the go lights at car racing. So typically Formula One lights. Somebody probably came up so with that. that right, and they have a particular pattern that they use to, to tell the drivers when to go. Um, and the basic idea is you light up all your lights to start with, and then you start turning your lights off. Then you wait a random amount of time between maybe one to three seconds. Then you turn some of them back on. And when they turn back on, that's when you can go. So the key thing is, is there's some random amount of time in there so that uh, you have to sort of be on guard for that random amount of time. Okay, so what we're gonna need to be able to do this is we're gonna need our Arduino, we're gonna need some lights, um, we're gonna need a button, and that's what the user will push to tell us when they've, to tell us that they've seen the lights change and we're gonna measure the reaction time. Uh, we'll need our Arduino, we're gonna need to, the Arduino is gonna coordinate lighting the lights and it's gonna count how many milliseconds it is between the go time and, and when the button gets pressed and we'll need to write a program to do all this. Um, the sort of good news about this is because, as I, was, as I was saying, about the sort of you know, ubiquity or the freedom of all this information, is you really don't even need me to do this. There are, I've, there are at least three links here, and if you just click on any one of these, or if you just Google Arduino Reaction Timer, you'll get a range of different projects that all look a little different, but they're similar. So here's one on Instructables, which is a great website. Um, you gotta sign in if you wanna see the full list on one page, but even if you don't sign in, you don't, you don't need to. Um, here's another one. And these are, you know, these are not hard to find. This one, so again, telling what you need. Most of these places will just give you the code as well. And I think for a lot of people, that's the scariest part, is I don't know how to program, I've never programmed before. But most of these places will give you the code, and then you can look at the code, and you can start to process little bits of it and say, well, I think I know what this little line does, and I think I know what that line does and you can work from there. This is a neat one A, he's got a, a, a video game button and a nice, a nice wooden box. This one also has a, an LCD display so to tell you exactly what your reaction time is. We're not gonna be able to get there today, but we'll still get some feedback. Okay, so if you wanna play along, if you wanna try and do this yourself, um, I know that not everybody has an Arduino, but the good news is you can, there's a, some decent Arduino simulators out there. So the one we use is this one, it's called, if you Google Arduino Simulator, this one is circuits.io, it's made from Autodesk who make AutoCAD. We're looking for the electronics lab, which is usually symbolized by this 
spidery looking thing that has a has a that's a dual inline package integrated circuit. But I'll work through it in real time here um, with you. So once you're in, we want to create a new. So there's a new, and then you'll go new electronics lab. And it should give us a breadboard. Now a breadboard is, a, is what we call, so where's my camera? Oh, my camera's way up there. Ah, it's this thing right there. And it should show that on the screen now. The breadboard has some hidden features. So you can see if I drag my mouse around here, it shows the thing that I'm clicking on and then some green circles. Those indicate that those, that, that column is all connected underneath the board. Whereas up here, I've got a row that's connected, and these rows are called rails. So we usually put power in in these rails, and these are just for connecting different things. So for example, if I wanted to add a component, up here on the right is plus components, I'll add a component. And let's just put in some really simple things to start with. Let's grab a nine volt battery, just drop it anywhere on there. I'll grab a light bulb, drop it in there as well. Okay. The way that I've put this 9-volt battery in, I've actually put a negative terminal and a positive terminal into one column that's connected. So that's going to short out that 9-volt battery, and it's going to kill the 9-volt battery really quickly, and I'm not going to get any electricity out of it. So I grab this, and I put it up onto one of my rails. Then I'm going to have this whole top row being connected to the negative terminal, and this bottom row connected to the positive terminal. So now all I need to do is wire up those lights, those, the terminals on the battery to the terminals on the light bulb, and we should be able to make the light bulb turn on. So just to see if we're able to do that, let's try that. Now a, a normal light bulb like this, it does not matter how you wire it up. It doesn't matter if you wire it up backwards or forwards. It's still going to work. So the key thing is that one of the wires goes to the red on the battery and the other goes to the black on the battery. And then once I've got that, I should be able to go start simulation, and my light bulb should light up. So, I should go. I'm going to get rid of these things now, which I can just usually click on it and then hit delete. Oh, I have to stop simulation first. There we go. Okay, so I can delete everything off here now, including the wires. Oh. Okay, so now I've got my breadboard. I'm going to add an Arduino, so I go to Components, search for an Arduino. An Arduino Uno should be fine. If yours is as laggy as mine, then please be patient. Okay, so we're almost there. We need to put on some lights and a button, right? So we'll go to Components. Um, just go to the main list again. All Components Grid. And I've got some LEDs. If I grab an LED and put it, it doesn't really matter, I usually put it down on the bottom there. And then you can copy and paste these. So if I just go Control C, Control V, yeah. And I make a line of them. Okay. I don't really want four red LEDs, I want to make one green. So if I've got it selected, I can change the color to being a green one. Okay, I'll make two reds, a green and a yellow in line here. Yellow, okay. I need a button. So if I go back to search and I type in button, I get a couple of options. I'll drag my button on here as well. The Arduino is, is neat because we can power it in lots of different ways. We could use a 9 volt to power it you, through this pin that's called VIN. It has a sort of a barrel jack connector, which you might see on laptops or other um, you know, portable speakers and that sort of thing. You can power it through that. You can power it through a USB and we'll power them off the computer. But we're going to get power out at this V5 volt. So that's going to produce 5 volts out. Even if we power it off something that's 9 volts, it'll give us 5 volts out. So we're going to take a wire and connect the 5 volt to the positive rail. About one of these, one of these rails that has a little red plus on it. Okay. We'll take another one from ground to the top rail. And since those are our power and ground lines, let's make them appropriately colored. So we'll select that one and make it black. Select this one and make it red. If only it's that easy in real life. <laughs> you can never find the right color or the right length wire in real life, but 
Okay, so we're going to build the interface circuits for these things. And at this point, it's not critical that you understand all the interface circuits or why we select certain components. If you want to ask later, I can do my best to explain it. But it, at this point, you can probably, you know, a lot of this stuff you can probably do without understanding everything. So we're going to need some resistors. So I'll go components. If I just stop searching, it's going to show me all the resistors, uh, resistor here. I can pick a resistor and I can change the value of it later. This is where it's really nice not to have to work in real life because in real life, picking resistors is like the least fun job. Okay, so I need this resistor to connect to the left pin of the LED and the top rail, the, the, the ground rail. Okay, so I'll just drop that in there. So it's important that it goes to the top rail and it goes to the left pin of that LED. And I'll change the value on this one to 300 ohm. So ohm is a, is a unit for the resistance of a thing, okay? Um, the, the electrical resistance. Now I can take this one and control C, control V, copy it over, and I want one resistor for every one of my LEDs. And if you've got your LEDs shifted a little bit so there isn't a hole there, you'll have to move your LED a little bit so that you can get that resistor into the, into the rail properly because the resistors don't want to bend sideways. That is one difference. In real life, you can put your resistors at any silly angle you want. So we want to be able to turn each one of these lights on through some software. We want to let our computer talk to these lights. And so we're going to use these digital pins here. Um, so if we wire up, for example, digital 8 to the right pin on that LED, when this pin gets set to high, so 5 volts, electricity will run through that wire, through this LED, through that resistor, and then back to ground, and we'll have a complete circuit. When that pin 8 is written low, the light will be off. So we'll just keep doing that. We'll do that for all of these lights. And we're going to need one more resistor for the button. And I'll just put it there. A couple more little wires here that I'm not going to go into too much detail about what they're for. Um, we need a pin to sense. This pin will ask whether the button's been pressed, and that's going to go right there. So now when the button gets pressed, this pin will be connected to the 5 volt rail, so that will go high. Okay? Oh, we should change the value of this resistor to something like 1, a bigger value, like 1 kilo ohm, or even 10 kilo ohms, but it's not that critical. The resistors here, when you, if you buy a kit, the kits usually come with two different values of resistors. They'll come with a 10 kilo ohm resistor, which is kind of a big resistor that doesn't let much current through. Um, it lets less than a, yeah. And then you'll have something like a 330 ohm resistor, which are these ones, um, which will let some current through. And for an LED, if we don't put that in there, we'll, we'll end up putting too much current through the LED and we'll break the LED. In a simulator, that's not gonna be a problem, but if we do that in real life, we are going to break our LEDs. So we put that resistor in there as a sort of way to limit the amount of current that goes through it. Um, there is a way to calculate that value, though. For LEDs at 5 volts, anything around 300 will be fine. Almost anything from 100 to 500 will be fine. If you use a really small one, it will be brighter, and it might get too bright. If you use a small one, a big one, it won't be bright enough. And this one is big because we don't actually want much current to go through it. All right, so we're not going to have time to go through the code on this, but that's okay. It's not, you know, but we'll, be, we'll show you the code. Um, the cool thing about the Arduinos, particularly the simulators, is there's lots of example code out there. So I know that if I was going to start coding, I usually would look at a language and look at what we call the syntax, and I would just go, oh my god, I have no idea, I can't do it. But you see, when I pulled up the code editor, it immediately opened up some example code with comments. So um, we can build on that to develop the code we need. And I'll show you the code, but I'll just outline roughly what what's the code looks like. So if we go, I'll, I'll leave the syntax for now. We'll go back to the PowerPoint and just have a think about what our, what our code needs to do, okay? So our code should first turn all the lights on so we can write a bit of code that says digital write high, particular pin numbers, those pins 8, 9, 10, and 11. We turn the lights off every second and to do that we can use a, a command called a delay. Delay 1000 is 1000 milliseconds, it won't do anything for a second. 
Once all the lights are off, we want to wait for a random amount of time between one and three seconds. Then we want to turn on the yellow and the green lights and remember the start time. Then we start checking to see if the button's being pressed. And it's important that we check that really regularly. We just keep checking. We just keep asking, has it been pressed, has it been pressed, has it been pressed, has it been pressed. And at, we do that at computer speeds, which means we're doing it at many, many thousands of times a second. Um, and eventually when it is pressed, we write down the time and we compare to the time that we had as a start time and take the difference, and that's our reaction time. And then we want to give the user some feedback. So what I've done here is I've decided to light up different numbers of lights depending on how well the player does. Okay? And then we might wait until the button gets pressed again so the player can play again. That's what the code looks like. Um, and I've put in some comments. And so if you want to have a go after this, the code's there. Um, if you, yeah, and, and so you can put that code into the simulator and if you have that circuit, it'll work. Um, and as a, uh, I will, let's see here. So you'd have to modify all those codes. We're not gonna do that, unfortunately, because we just don't have time. Um, like that. Okay, I'll show you what it looks like uh, if we actually, when we build it. So we just plug a USB into the, Computer. I've already programmed this one, so I don't have to put. I don't have to download the new code. Um, so I've got. I can't see the lights unless I'm right above them. There, I've got two lights. That means I'm supposed to press the button. Now I got no lights because I was so slow. But if I play again, all four lights are up. Last light, waiting for them to light up. Okay, I got one light. Pretty slow. Try it one more time. And still slow. I'm faster when I'm looking straight down on it. Anyway, so that's what it looks like when we've wired it up. And we see we've got these four little resistors, that resistor, a button. So it looks very much like we did in the simulator. Um, all right, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Um, when, you, when you do play it, you might find that you want to adjust the cutoffs to keep things interesting. Um, you might also find that players can cheat. So if you can, in, in the, the first way you do it, you might find that if you just hold the button down, you can give yourself an amazing reaction time. So we'd have to think about what we could do to prevent players from cheating. And there's lots of ways to do that. I won't give you the answers. Um, and if you wanted to go further, I thought I'd show you a few other little things that are useful and fun. So here's another game that, that we've built every once in a while that actually some students built recently. Um, let's see here. This one's harder to see. It's like Tetris. Uh, and there's a little light that comes down and you have to use the, an accelerometer in here, a little sensor, to move out of the way. And an accelerometer like this, um, you know, is a $15 chip, but it has all the accelerometers that are in your phone. It's got a gyro, it's got a magnetometer, so it can really tell you which way it's tipping. So in order to play this game, I have to tip this phone back and left and right to avoid the, uh, avoid the little asteroids that are coming down from the sky. Anyway, another one. Um, other things that we use are special motors like this type of motor called a stepper motor, which is excellent for position control. These are sort of 20 bucks to 30 bucks. We build, if you get a 3D printer, we can build little jigs for holding things. This is a, a 3D printed holder for a motor with a sensor on it that we can use to read how fast things are going. Um, for automation, we like little things like this, which is an air switch, so we can control air pressure going one way or another. Um, we sometimes put things together on boards. This is a little printed circuit board that we can put the LEDs and the resistors on, and then this is one for playing another little game. It has a button. It's a version of Bop It game, so there's a light that bounces back and forth, and you have to hit the button when it's in the right place. Um, and then if you get really nerdy, you get one of these, which is a digital multimeter. Um, and these are running out anywhere from 20 bucks to, well, whatever you want to spend, but they're really handy. Uh, and so that's something else we try and get our people to think about. All right, so just a last little slide about why do we care, why do I care. And um, it's my understanding that programming literacy in Australia is getting worse, not better. And I think that this sort of ability to program things that really do our real life is not completely on the computer is interesting. It's more fun. Um, but understanding software is really important because it's in everything. It's in our phones, it's in our cars, it's in our PayWave credit cards, it's in our watches, it's in our washing machines. Uh, and most programming that's really done by people who get paid to program is done using keystrokes, not drag and drop. And, and a lot of us get an introduction to drag and drop programming through things like Scratch, but ultimately you've got to move on to, to mostly have to move on to some sort of 
keystroke-based programming. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's people who know how to program that are going to maintain things of the future, that are going to maintain everything that has software in it, they're going to certify things that have software in it. You're going to have to make legislation about things with software in them, um, particularly around things like new self-driving cars. Um, look, automation and mechatronics is a part of our economy. It's going to be a part of our economy forever. There are lots of things that have to be made locally, even if we outsource just about everything. We still want our muffins made locally, and we still need our concrete made locally. And so those things are always still going to be made by people living in and around our communities. Um, Telstra's running commercials right now that are reminding us that Arthur C. Clarke imagined that advanced societies look like magic, but they don't look like that to everyone, and they don't have to look like that to engineers. So anyway, good luck on all your guys' science and engineering and et cetera adventures and, or art or whatever you want to do with this stuff. I hope, uh, hope you find it interesting. Thanks. So this, this thing here came out of Italy about eight years ago as an open source electronics prototyping platform. And the fact that they made it open source was an important decision because it meant that they had, it had some slow growth, but they had lots of people who got on board and said, I can find uses for this. I can find, I can figure out fun things to do with this. And so there were lots of people who thought, oh, you know what, I can automate my fish feeding or I can automate the fan in my house or I can make something cool at Burning Man with an Arduino. And, and if, you go to, if you know what Burning Man is, these things are everywhere all over Burning Man because people want to automate things or, or you want to, you want to I, I know a guy, he wants to log data on his motorcycle. So this is the sort of thing you use because they're really cheap. No one's trying to make a bunch of money off it. Um, and so now there are lots of companies that make similar boards that are all compatible with the same programming language. Um, and there are just huge communities of people who give examples of how to do stuff. What it is, is a processor, a simple processor, surrounded by some electronics that allow it to take digital information in or analog information in and put digital information out and be powered by some simple things like batteries or USBs and things like that. So that board will cost about $40 at most uh, electronic shops. But there are also lots of similar ones now from other companies that will run you as low as 12 bucks. Um, and with various other communities, slight variations on programming, um, slightly different capabilities on inputs and outputs. Um, there are some good uh, drones, helicopters and things like that that will run on Arduinos as well. Oh, I know, I'm so excited about the possibility that my kids might not have to get a, driving, a driver's license and that I could maybe sleep on the way to the beach when I go to surf, because if I don't live that close to the beach, so it's like a, an hour drive to the beach, so I gotta get up at five in the morning, go for an hour surf, and then come back in, I'm like, oh, I could sleep on the car on the beach, oh, how good would that be? So, it's really up to legislation. Um, the Volvo XC90, the newest one, is capable of 100% autonomous driving. I believe that the Teslas are largely capable of 100% autonomous driving, but, um, they're not really allowed to and, and some of that's reasonable and that we should go a little bit slow with this stuff And there was a bit of news recently because somebody died or had a bad accident I can't remember. I think someone died while their Tesla was in its self-driving mode though The Tesla self-driving mode for example, you have to put your hands on the wheel every three minutes um, Or actually it's less than that every once in a while you have to put your hands on the wheel and the question is I think which model are we going to take? Are we going to end up with something like the Google car, which doesn't have a steering wheel, versus a, a normal looking car that can self-drive? And one analogy you can look at is an elevator. Um, when elevators first came on the market, they were driven by people. They had an, a, a lift operator who stood in there and took you to the floors, and they didn't stop directly at the floors. The driver had to stop it at the right floor. And eventually, Companies thought, hey, we can automate this, uh, and then we don't have to pay someone to, to be in the elevator. But what are people going to think about being locked in a metal box with a big, with you know, no control over anything? Like, would you just willingly step into a big metal box with a big screen door that, with a steel door that locks you in for ten minutes and goes between floors? I think we do it now, but we don't think about it because we've been doing it since we were kids. But initially, that was a very, very scary thing. And I think there's some of those same fears about: Would you get in a car that has no steering wheel and no brake, and it's just a metal box that's going to whisk you around the city? Um, and uh, I think that that's the, the way the elevator companies decided to do it was, yes, we'll have a, a big metal box that you'll get into and you won't have any control except you tell it where to go to, but, but we'll give you a red button 
and you can hit the red button and it will stop and then you can call for help and I think that the cars will ultimately the most successful cars will be the same and and look I still think it's entirely possible within a few, five years but it's up to it's up to people who are scientifically literate to make the case that that and who can think about policy to convince people that there are ways to manage this because I know lots of people who are scientifically literate but who I don't know, maybe haven't thought through all of the things and about the legal things and the policy about what are we going to do, but I think it's all entirely manageable and that this is totally doable, that we can have cars on the road that you get in and it is a red button and you hit the red button and stop. But anyway, there are still lots of questions, but let's hope for five years. The code that was complete was on the PowerPoint. So this code is complete and it will work as we've drawn it up there, okay? So if you've still got that up there, you can take that. What was on the simulator was not complete, but there is complete workable code in the PowerPoint presentation. Thanks, David.